Hello everybody and welcome back. So we're just going to pick up right where we left off. We're just plugging through this so-called simple linear regression problem. We've already filled out the ANOVA, we've already filled out the regression statistics, we've talked about the F test, and we've talked about the R square and multiple R. What I want to do now in this video is to complete this third table that comes from the Excel output. And this is going to require that we calculate our coefficients, T stats, and some intervals. And then we can go through and, and talk a little bit more about interpreting those results. So in this table, the first thing that I'm going to do is calculate my slope coefficient. I'm going to start off here because really I need that slope coefficient in order to obtain my intercept and then we'll be able to move through horizontally through that table once we've got those coefficients. So our slope coefficient, it's a little bit of a tedious calculation. Let me just clean up some room here. It has some similarities to our module 13 types of calculations where we're, we're calculating all of these differences. In some cases, we're squaring them and we're adding all these things together. So it's a, maybe a familiar pattern of calculations. The formula for that slope, here we're looking at the differences between our independent values and that sample mean, so xi and x bar. And so here's that independent variable x. So we're looking at hours of study and we already have the sample mean given to us here. Multiply that by the same types of calculations along the dependent variable, which I have right here. Then we divide by the sum of these squared deviations along our x variable. So a little bit tedious, a little bit time consuming, but we'll do this step by step. And then hopefully again, it's one of these things that as you get some practice doing them, you'll, you'll see the pattern, you'll see the routine. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna calculate those differences. And then just for sake of, of efficiency, while I have those numbers on my calculator screen, I'm going to square them because I'm going to need those. We add those up. That's going to give me the denominator of this calculation, right? That will give me that term right there. For the numerator, I also need these differences and I need to multiply that first column and that last column. And then when we add those up, that gives us our numerator, which will be here, okay? So let's first start calculating those differences along our x variable. So I'm gonna be looking at Oops, each of these values and their difference from that sample mean, 3.6, and then I'm gonna square it so that I can simultaneously fill out this column at the same time, okay? So 3.2 minus 3.66. So that gives me negative 46. While I have that on my calculator screen, I'm gonna square that. 2116. Now the next one, I'm at 3.9 minus 366. That gives me 0.24. I'm going to square that 0 0.576. 2.4 minus 366. That gives me negative 126. And when I square that, I have 1.5876. Oops, how did I get a separate 8 in there? 5876. Now I'm at the 3.7 366. And square that 
And the very last one, 5.1 minus 366. And there we go. So I've got those first two columns. Now I'm going to add up that second column, right? Because I've already got all of this, all of these terms. So now I'm going to add it up, add them together. So I'll start at the bottom because that's what I have on my screen. Add the 0016 plus 1.5876 plus 0 0.0576 plus 0.2116. And so this gives me 3.932. So there's my denominator for that calculation. Now I'm going to do the numerator. And I'm going to do these next two columns also sort of simultaneously. I'll calculate the difference. So I'm going to calculate this value first. And then I'll multiply it by that first column. And then that will give me the first value in that last column. So what I'm going to do, I'm working with this information here now. So I'm going to start here with 43 minus 61.2. And so that gives me negative 18.2. Now I'm going to multiply it by that very first column, right over here, whoops. I'm going to multiply it by this column. So multiplied by 0.46, that's a negative. And so that gives me my first value here, 8.36. Now we'll do the next one, 71 minus 61.2. So that gives me 9.8. Now I'm going to multiply that by 0.24. Whoops, well, something went horribly wrong there. Multiply by 0.24, and that gives me 2.352. Okay, now my next one, here I'm at 36 minus 61.2 minus 25.52 multiplied by negative 126 that gives me 31752 now the next one 75 minus 61.2 is 13.8 Multiply by 0 0.04552, and the last one is 81 minus 61.2, 19.8, multiplied by 144, 28.512. Tedious, yes, as so many of the calculations seem to be in these last couple modules. Now I'm going to add up that last column. So here I'm going to add up all of these values here. I'll start at the bottom because that's what I have on my screen. Plus 0.552 plus 31752 plus 2352 plus 8372. And that gives me 71.54. So here I have 71.54 divided by 3.932. And that gives me my slope 18.19. Okay, that's the worst of it. Of all of these calculations, that's the worst one. So here I have 18.19. Now, we can revisit a calculation that we did in the past. Because remember, when we calculated this multiple r in the previous video, all that gave us was the measure of linear association. It didn't tell us whether it was positive or negative. That depended on the sign of that coefficient. Well, now I have that coefficient, and now I see that it's positive. So this is really a positive coefficient.
correlation, and the magnitude of that correlation is 0.89. So now I can complete that last little detail from up above. Let's now get our intercept. So we've got our coefficient, our intercept, b0, much simpler. b0 is dependent on the average of the dependent variable minus that slope and the average of the x of the independent variable. So y bar, I can come up here, 61.2 minus 1819, and x bar I have here is 3.66. So that gives me 61.2 minus 1819 times 366. That gives me a coefficient for the intercept, 5.38. There, we have everything we need now for our estimated regression equation. We have that intercept, and we have that slope. So if all we needed was that estimated regression equation, well, there, we have it. But let's finish up this table. Let's go through and get the standard error t-test, everything, so we can do testing, and then we'll get into interpreting these results, okay? So our standard error for the slope. The notation that is frequently used there is that standard error, subscript b, subscript 1. That is equal to the standard error of the regression divided by something, thankfully, we've already calculated, the square root of the sum of these squared deviations from the mean. Well, hopefully this looks familiar because we already calculated that right up here. So I don't want to use a whole bunch of time again recalculating that same thing. That was that 3.932 that we have here and there. The numerator for that calculation, s, well, that's the standard error of the regression. And s, that standard error, we've already got that here as well, 10.7. So you can see again how some of these later calculations are reliant on calculations that we've already done. So again, that gives us some idea of you know, how we have to go through it in the proper order of these types of problems where we're filling out one of these tables. So I've got everything that I need. I have the standard error of the regression is 10.7 divided by the square root of that value is 3.932, 3.932, and so that gives me 10.7 divided by the square root of 3.932. That gives me a standard error of 5.39. Well, if I round it, I guess that'll give us 5.4. Good. Now we can get our test statistics. Those test statistics oh, for the t-tests, they're the same as they've always been. There's a point estimate divided by the standard error. It's the same basic structure that it's been since module nine, when we are doing what probably now feels like relatively simple calculations. So that first one, well, both of them really, it's the coefficient divided by the standard error of the coefficient. So for the intercept, negative 538, divided by 20.31, 20.31, and that is negative 0.27, and the next one for the slope, 1819, divided by its standard error, 5.4, And wouldn't you know it, 
Remember this one from the previous video? That is a handy little way to check your work or maybe a shortcut because maybe I can get through to that test statistic a little bit faster if I know, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. If I remember, if I know the relationship between the t-tests or the test statistics for the t-test and for the f-test. Because here you can see, how did I get that? I took the square root of the f-statistic. Well, there's a, a, a straightforward relationship between the f-distribution and the t-distribution. Any f-value that has one numerator degree of freedom, and let's say, just for sake of simplicity, k denominator degrees of freedom, is equal to the t statistic with k degrees of freedom squared. So I was able to reverse this a little bit and say, well, I want that t, that's just gonna be the square root of the f. And this is what I did here to kind of take a shortcut to that T statistic. But again, you can use this as a double check on some of your work because those results will always be the same. If you get different numbers, calculating it this way and going through this calculation, well, it means that maybe you've made a mistake somewhere else. It's not gonna tell you where you made the mistake, but if you get different numbers, then you know that there's a mistake somewhere. And you can, hopefully you'll have time, and you can go through and maybe try to figure out where that mistake happened. So here we have our test statistic. We know it's right, we've confirmed it. Two different calculations, 3.37. Now we can get our p-value. So here we're working with a T distribution. This has um, always the same degrees of freedom as our estimate of the variance, which here, our estimate of the variance, MSE, has three degrees of freedom. So I come down to my T distribution, three degrees of freedom, my test statistic, 3.37. I'm in between these two. So here are those probabilities. Really, really easy mistake to make here. Because here we are now in module 14. How long has it been since you've done a t-test? We've been doing all these chi-square tests, f-tests, etc., etc. All upper tail tests, mostly upper tail tests. What is the test here? Well, these tests on those individual parameters on the slope and on the intercept, well, they're what we call tests for individual parameter significance. So each of those tests would take the form beta i is equal to zero or not equal to zero. And I put i, i would be zero or one or two or three, which, whichever coefficient we're testing. If we're looking at that slope, which we're looking at right now, well, this is going to be beta one is equal to zero or not equal to zero. Well, where have you seen that before? Well, my goodness, that's exactly what it was. Maybe I've deleted it now, but that's exactly what this F test was. That F test was a test for overall model significance. And this simple linear regression model, the overall model, only had one independent variable. And so that F test, if you recall, that F test was beta one is equal to zero, beta two, oops, no, beta one not equal to zero. And that was a upper tail F test because that F test was developed by obtaining these two different estimates of variance and performing a test to see if one was statistically greater than the other. Just like everything we did in module 13, we found, yes, that was statistically significant. Now we're doing tests on individual parameter significance, and now you can see here for the simple linear regression, and only for the simple linear regression, that test on the slope is identical to the F test. 
And that's only because our model contains just one independent variable. When we get into module 15, you'll see that they're different. So here we have a test that looks exactly the same, but this is a t-test. This is not an upper tail test. This is the t-test, specifically this is a two-tailed t-test. So it's a really easy mistake to make. We understand that the null and alternatives are identical, but this one, the methodology that is employed that one is an upper tail F test, right? That was the one using that ANOVA. This one here, this is a two tailed T test. So when I look at my results in my T tables and I see these probabilities between 0.02 and 0.025, this is a two tailed test. So I have to remember to double those. So my p-value here is going to be less than 0.05, greater than 0.04. Again, because I'm doubling, multiply that by 2, multiply that by 2. So that's the 0.05, that's the 0.04. Now, if you're doing this in Excel, if you're doing this with precision, which we're not because we're using the t-tables and we've got some rounding error in here, and if you're doing this with precision, you would actually see that this test statistic, uh, sorry, this p-value is identical. In every decimal place, they are identical. Why? Well, it's the same test. And of course, we've already talked about the relationship between those test statistics. It's exactly the same test. Your results are going to be exactly consistent. Okay, let's carry on. We're almost done. Let's get into the confidence intervals. So the formula for those confidence intervals, we have again our point estimate, plus or minus, some critical value with n minus k degrees of freedom, because that corresponds to our estimate of the variance, times the standard error of that coefficient. So if we're gonna do one for the interval, then that point estimate is 5.38, negative 5.38, plus or minus, I need that critical T, and again, this is an interval, we need alpha divided by two, so if we're doing these at 95, which we are, then that's gonna be 0.025. So this is going to be, again, n minus k, that's 3. Alpha divided by 2, this is 0.025. So I come down here, 0.025, 3 degrees of freedom, 3.182. And that standard error we have here, 20.31. And that's all I need. So here's that point estimate in the middle. Now I can have my lower limit minus 3.182 times 20.31, negative almost exactly 70. And the upper limit 3.182 times 20.31, 59. 27. So there's my lower limit is negative 70, upper limit is 59, 27. You should see something familiar there too, right? That p-value is huge. That y-intercept is not statistically different from zero. And so what do you expect to see in that confidence interval? Based on all of your understandings of confidence intervals going back to module 9, well, look at that. I've got the hypothesized value is in that interval, right? The hypothesized value for these tests, for both the slope and the intercept, the hypothesized value is 0. So when I see that p-value is so large, and I know that I'm not rejecting that test, that it is not statistically different from 0, well, once again, I see that consistency in that interval. I see the hypothesized value zero exists in that interval. Everything here 
coming up consistent with what I would expect. The next one. For our slope, our slope was 18.19 plus or minus that same critical T and its standard error, which was here, 5.4. So that gives us an interval if I have 18.19 minus 3.182 times 5.4, 1.01, 1819 plus 3.182 times 5.4, 35.37. So here's 1.01, here's 3537. And of course, that one too is statistically significant. We rejected that null hypothesis with that p-value, right? So for that one, we found it is different from zero. And so of course, our interval is consistent with that. It is at that level of confidence, it is different from zero because zero is not contained within that interval. Okay, so what does that feel like? About four hours later, these couple of videos we've gone through, and we've filled out everything. It's time consuming, it's tedious, there's a lot here, and then we're still not done. We still have part C. I'll do another video for that one. So let's just briefly go through some of the interpretation of these results. So we've already interpreted the R-square, that measure of goodness of fit. Our independent variable, in this case, the amount of time that a student spends studying, explains 79% of the variation in their grade. This is a fairly strong fit. Remember that R-square is a measure of goodness of fit. The higher, the better. One is as large as it will ever get. Zero is as low as it will ever get. So here we're getting pretty close to one. 79%, that's a pretty good fit. That means there's a pretty strong relationship there. And of course, that multiple R, that confirms that there's a pretty strong positive linear association between these two variables. The more you study, the better your grade will be. And that's a fairly strong relationship, as we can see with that 0.89 value. Now, coming down here, we've already gone through the F-test. We've talked about those F-test results. Now we have our estimated regression equation. So the focus of the interpretation here really is going to be on that slope. This is telling me a marginal effect, a one unit change in X. What effect is that going to have on Y? Well, remember, this is hours, and this is grade. And grade is measured, it's not stated explicitly here, but that's going to be a percentage. So what does this tell me? For each unit change in x, x is measured in hours. So at one hour, change, so let's say an increase, for each additional hour that the student spends studying, that corresponds with an increase in average grade of 18.19 percentage points. Okay, so again, for each additional hour, because those are the units we're talking about, for each additional hour, that corresponds with an increase, because that's positive, in average grade of 18.19 percentage points. Okay, so that's how we would interpret that marginal effect, that slope. And that is not going to change even when we get into module 15. When we get into multiple regression, interpreting those slopes doesn't change. So it's good to have a grasp of it now. We've gone through our tests. We found that our intercept is not statistically different from zero. So our line, if we were to draw this, it crosses through at negative 5.3, but it was found that that is not statistically different from zero. In the context of this problem, 
I don't really care. That doesn't really tell me anything of value. So I'm not going to worry too much on that value itself. That's why I'm not even interpreting that slope. And I'm not worried about the fact that it's not statistically different from zero. Again, what my interpretation is going to focus on here is hours. Because that's my variable. That's what I'm using to try to predict grade. So I'm not even going to worry in this problem. I'm not going to worry about that interpretation of the interval because it doesn't really hold any value for me. But when I look at the slope, so we've interpreted the coefficient. We understand what that means. We know that it is statistically significant. So that relationship is statistically significant. The number of hours spent studying is a valid predictor of what a student's grade will be. That relationship is statistically significant. Here, I have a 95% interval estimate for the marginal effect. So that marginal effect, that's what we just talked about here. For each additional hour that the student spends studying, that corresponds with an increase in average grade of 18.19. That's that point, of point estimate. Right? That is the point estimate of that marginal effect. Think back to module 8 when you were first learning about confidence intervals. Remember, we had that point estimate was in the middle, and then we had those lower limits and those upper limits. Well, it's the same idea here. There's that point estimate. I also have an interval estimate. So now I can say I'm 95% confident that each additional hour that the student spends studying corresponds with an increase in average grade of between 1 and 35 points. I'm rounding that a little bit. Okay, so the point estimate, each additional hour contributes an increase in average grade of 18.19 points. Right, that's the point estimate. The interval, I'm 95% confident that for each additional hour that the student spends studying, average grade will increase by between 1 and 35.37 points. Okay, what a long video, but look how much work we've gone through. We're almost done. Here we've gone through this last problem. We talked about interpreting those coefficients, interpreting those confidence intervals. What was the other use for regression? understanding the nature of the relationship, and using it for prediction. So that's what we'll do in the next video. We're going to use the estimated regression equation, and we'll actually do two things. We'll, we'll use it to obtain a point estimate, and we'll use it to develop an interval estimate, a different type of interval estimate than the one that we have just discussed. This one will be an interval estimate for our predicted value. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Hope this was helpful. Take care. Bye-bye.